When us comic book fans think about Marvel Comics, we think about the company that is one of the big two industry giants, and we think about the company that gave us such beloved superheroes as Spider-Man, the Hulk, Thor, Captain America, Iron Man, and many, many more. But I bet many of us never stopped to think about the integral role that Marvel Comics played in the establishment of the comic book collecting hobby. And that is what we are going to be talking about today. Right here, right now, coming at ya. Hello to all my mighty Marvelites, Dante D here, and welcome to the channel where we talk about comic books and other geek stuff. So we know Marvel Comics as one of the most influential comic book companies of all time. It is the company that gave us heroes like Spider-Man, who arguably is the most popular superhero of all time. And Marvel is also the company that gave us something new and innovative back in the Silver Age, and that was Heroes with Problems. But little did Marvel know that through the creation of the Marvel Universe and Heroes with Problems, they started a new hobby, and that would be comic book collecting. In discussions that I've had with people about the origins of the comic book collecting hobby, many have asserted to me that they believe that the comic book that started the whole hobby was Action Comics number one, because Action Comics number one is the, the comic that gave us the first superhero of all time, Superman, and he was the character that pretty much established the superhero archetype. Yes, that is all true, but I would respectfully disagree that Action Comics Number one is the comic book that started the comic book collecting hobby. And that is only because back in 1938, when Action Comics number one was published, comic books were things that people did not typically keep. Comic books were essentially seen as useless children's waste. In addition to that, 1938 was also in and around the time that World War II started. And by the time the United States was fully entrenched in the war, the government ran paper drives that they encouraged U.S. citizens to participate in. And these were drives where people could donate useless paper that they would otherwise recycle for the purpose of printing war propaganda. So knowing this, the first thing that mom wanted to always get rid of were those damn comic books that were accumulating in their children's bedrooms. On top of that, comic book publishers included messages in their comic books to encourage children to donate their read used comic books to the war effort. The fact that these comic books during the golden age were either donated or just simply thrown out rendered them really hot, expensive collectibles years and years later up to modern day. I mean, look at Action Comics number one. It's probably the most expensive comic book of all time. It, one sold not too long ago for $3 million in auction. But that certainly was not when the comic book collecting hobby started. Sure, there probably were a few kids that just kept their comic books because maybe they just kind of kept everything and just kind of threw them in a trunk or locked them away in an attic and just forgot about them. But for the most part, comic books were disposable. And that is pretty much how it stayed until the 1960s. Again, there are exceptions to that rule, but it was very, very rare and not really mainstream until you got to the 1960s. So 1961 comes around and Marvel is tired of playing catch up and follow the leader with other publishers. After World War II, Marvel really struggled to stay relevant in the comic book industry because frankly, people lost interest in superheroes for a while and other types of genres like horror and teenage dramas were really prevailing in the comic book industry. But Marvel really did not put out anything that significant during this time period and they were just trying to copy or trying to replicate what other publishers were doing. Stan Lee was most tired of what Marvel was doing at the time and he was at the point where he was even ready to quit. But his wife convinced him to do a book the way that he wanted to do it for once. So he created the Fantastic Four and with Fantastic Four number one from 1961, the Marvel Universe was created. Little did Stan know though that the Fantastic Four number one would start a craze and would essentially create what people would refer to as the Marvel Age of Comics. The Fantastic Four number one was a revolutionary comic book, not just because it portrayed heroes with problems, but it also gave us something new, and that was a cohesive 
comic book universe that crossed over with other comic books being published by that same publisher. Readers started noticing that the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man and Hulk and Thor and Iron Man, they all were part of the same universe. And this really was not done before Marvel Comics. I mean, yeah, you can argue a little bit that DC did this a little bit with Batman and Superman. They appeared on some of the same covers back in the Golden Age, but it was never done to this extent, or to the extent that Marvel did it until the 1960s. Once readers got the sense that all of their favorite characters coexisted in the same universe, Marvel started doing something very interesting. They started referencing what was going on in other comic books. So for example, you're reading The Amazing Spider-Man, which is your all-time favorite superhero, and you haven't really dabbled in the Hulk or Fantastic Four that much. But now, as you're reading Amazing Spider-Man, they're referencing something that happened in The Incredible Hulk or in The Fantastic Four. And Marvel was not only referencing what was going on in other comic books, sure enough, they started having these characters appear in each other's titles. So imagine the excitement of kids and young adults in the 1960s seeing Spider-Man now appearing with the Fantastic Four in the same comic book or the Incredible Hulk appearing with Thor in the same comic book. That must have been amazing for them. On top of that, these little stars started appearing in character speech bubbles and at the bottom of the panel, a little footnote would appear saying, to find out more about this, see the Incredible Hulk number 76. And that would just drive people crazy. I know it personally drove me crazy when I started collecting comic books because I'd be picking up all these comic books and I would see this little footnote telling me to go and check out this other comic book and I would go nuts. I would be like, okay, I need to go and find out what is happening and what they're talking about. So I would feverishly look for this particular issue. Now I know if I experienced that, I'm pretty sure a good portion of other comic book fans experienced that same sensation when seeing those little stars footnotes appearing at the bottom of comic book panels. Now this was a great business decision on Marvel's part because it encouraged comic book readers to check out other books that Marvel was publishing at the time. And it worked. Most kids and young adults that read one Marvel comic book most likely were into other ones as well. Then something curious happened. People started looking for back issues. They wanted to know what happened in their hero's earliest adventures because as the series progressed, a lot of times these books would reference something that happened even 50 issues ago. So readers, comic book readers, would go and seek out these back issues to find out and read for themselves what exactly they were referencing. Now you have a handful of fans all looking for that same book, but there are only so many of those books left because at this time people still were inconsistently throwing out comic books. And that is what raised the prices of these issues. It's simple supply and demand. And that was the dawn of the comic book collecting hobby. Some comic book fans took note of this and even started opening up shops that specialized in selling these back issues to comic book fans. And once the shops started popping up, so did the ads in the comic books. In the late 1960s, you start seeing a lot of ads in comic books advertising comic book back issues. And that probably added even more to comic book fans' excitement over comic books in general and the whole hobby. They're probably reading their favorite comic book and decided, hmm, I want to get this particular back issue. So then they start referencing these ads to see if they can get that particular issue that they're looking for. The comic book collecting hobby enjoyed a steady increase in popularity throughout the 1960s and the 1970s. But something happened in the late 1970s that just made the popularity of comic book collecting explode. And that was the discovery of the Mile High Collection by Chuck Rosansky of Mile High Comics. Now we've talked about Chuck Rosansky and the Mile High comic book collection on the channel before. It was actually one of the first videos that I ever did for the channel. Uh, I'll put the link in the description if 
you want to check it out. And uh, that video talks in depth about the discovery of the Mile High Collection. Basically, all you need to know about the Mile High Collection is that Chuck Rosansky was a comic book dealer who was struggling to make ends meet selling comic book back issues. But then he discovered this treasure chest trove of comic books from the golden age that were really, really scarce, even back in the 1970s. He found very, very rare, significant issues from the golden age that comic book fans in the 1970s probably had a really, really hard time finding. Books like Action Comics number one, Detective 27, all the first appearances of major DC characters. What followed the discovery of the Mile High Collection was Chuck Rosansky contacting Marvel and starting to run these big two-page ads in Marvel comic books in the early 1980s, selling these comic books and even other comic books to fans. And these ads, if I remember correctly, were run exclusively in Marvel Comics. If you were around in the 1980s or in the early 1980s and you were reading Marvel Comics, you remember those Mile High Comics ads that ran in Marvel comic books. They were everywhere. Those ads were good for Chuck Rosansky, they were good for Marvel, and they were good for the comic book collecting hobby. So there again, you see Marvel comics contributing to the rise in popularity of the comic book collecting hobby. So as you can see with everything we've been talking about for the last few minutes, Marvel was pretty much the company that started comic book collecting. DC followed along in these practices later on, but I really feel that it was Marvel that started these practices, which contributed to the rise in popularity of comic books. Then of course you have Marvel in the late 1980s and the early 1990s and everything that they did to start a frenzy over comic book collecting. But I don't wanna talk about that too much in depth. We've talked about that on the channel before, and I feel that a lot of the practices that Marvel engaged in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, other publishers were doing at the time too and were guilty of, like, like DC Comics and, and even Image. Uh, but on top of it, I feel like those practices were really kind of toxic and um, they were really bad for comic books overall because there was this big bubble that burst later on in the 1990s. But again, if you wanna know more about that, check out the video that we did about uh, Marvel Comics and how they almost destroyed the comic book industry. The link is in the description. So that about does it for our video today. I really hope that you enjoyed it. I would love to hear from you all in the comments. Let me know some other comics or some other companies or some other practices that you feel really contributed to the rise in popularity of the comic book collecting hobby. Until next time, this is Dante D signing off. I will see you all in the next episode.